All right, we better get started if we're going to finish by one. Um, I guess some of you are starting to get hungry, like I am. So, after that talk uh, just now, you're probably feeling a bit gloomy about all the horrible things that are around the corner and nasty things are going to spring up. Hopefully you won't feel quite so gloomy at the end of that talk because, you know, we do have the technology. Now I want to take us to one step further in terms of optimism, is that we actually can eradicate diseases. And I'm going to give you some examples of how we've made progress in this regard over uh, recent years, decades, and so forth. So again, let's just, just show us where we are. So if we look at definitions of terms, controlling a, a disease is just reducing it, a uh, substantial reduction of disease within the given setting. Um, and you know, we, we can do that. We, do, we have done that. We say MRSA. We've managed to control it quite well over the last 10 years. The numbers have come down from a peak maybe eight, nine years ago. But we haven't got rid of it. It's still there. Elimination is used to, re re to describe the reduction of incidence to a very low level. You may still need to have the kind of finger in the hole in the dike type mentality of keeping things under control. You haven't actually got rid of them completely from the planet. Um, and there is always the risk that they'll resurge when you stop your interventions. So there's some examples of diphtheria and poliomyelitis that listed there. Uh, you could argue, like, say, whooping cough was something that we really pushed down to low levels, and now it's come back up again because of the idiocy of some people not vaccinating their children. Eradication is where we actually do completely get rid of the organism and wipe it off the face of the earth, at least remove it from every ounce of human flesh on the planet. Um, extinction is where we do all that and we destroy any stocks so that there is no way back um, for the organism. It's gone. And there aren't any where we've done that up till now. So in terms of global eradication, you know, this is an amazingly ambitious idea to actually rid the whole world of an infection. Well, we have done it twice now. So we've done it with smallpox in humans and we've done it with the disease of, of cattle called rinderpest. And um, I didn't really appreciate the importance, I, I know quite a lot about smallpox now, but I didn't really appreciate the importance of rinderpest until I was watching a program on television about... Uh, the Serengeti National Park in, in Africa. And they pointed out that around, I think it was towards the end of the 19th century, there was a massive uh, crisis in Africa with huge numbers of deaths because of the failure of the cattle due to rinderpest. And the, millions of Africans, I think, died uh, at that time. Anyway, I'm getting off the subject a bit. There are ongoing programs to eradicate various other diseases which are listed there. I won't go through all of them in detail. <coughs> There are some things that we could argue might be eradicable if we sat down you know, in an armchair and had an armchair debate as to what could we get rid of. And there are some things where we've tried and failed, aborted programs. And we mentioned malaria in a previous talk where back in the 50s there was this idea, yeah, we can do it. And then we kind of, by the time we got to the 70s, we said, no, we can't. Um, now I'm going to focus on smallpox now. Um, so smallpox, or variola, it's got its Latin name, is an acute contagious disease unique to humans. It's caused by the variola virus, which is a large, complex DNA virus. In fact, uh, in its day, it was the largest and most complex virus we knew. Things have changed a bit since then, but it is quite a remarkable virus. Airborne transmission, and it produces this so-called centrifugal rash, which means that uh, it's the, the, the extremities, um, actually, where you see it most dramatically, um, and, and that's where it ends up. Uh, and that's distinctive from things like chickenpox, where the trunk is more affected. There's this maculopapular and then vesicular rash. So what that means is you get little uh, red spots. The red spots become sort of slightly uh, indurated from... Um, papules and then they actually blister up and in fact the blisters then become full of pus and they become pustules 
Uh, here are some uh, images to show you what it looked like. Uh, really quite a horrific disease. Um, in the worst cases, you get a confluent rash where, in fact, there isn't much gap or no gap between the individual pustules and whole areas of the skin are just affected and lifted up. And you can see here the dis distribution of the rash between smallpox and chickenpox are quite different. Now, in terms of the disease, there were two main variants. Classical smallpox, variable, the major, was a very dangerous disease. It had a mortality rate about a third of the people who got it died. Um, and there were various clinical uh, paths you could take through the illness. The worst case is where you suddenly develop hemorrhage, hemorrhagic form, and, and you've got this malignant form where you rapidly succumb to the disease that just took over this kind of storm of cytokines that killed you. Strangely, in um, temperate climates, towards the end of the 19th, early part of the 20th century, variola major tended to be eased out by a, a milder variant called variola minor, sometimes called allostrin. And this uh, had the same kind of symptomatology, same kind of rash and incubation period and so on, but it had a much lower mortality rate of, of, of less than 1%. Those that smallpox didn't kill, it maimed. It caused widespread scarring. You can see this boy here. Got these scars all over his face. Um, blindness if it affected the cornea. Limb deformities. So horrible disease. In terms of progression, well, you have an incubation period of about 12 days, typically. You then get a fever. Um, in this kind of so-called prodromal period. So you start to feel pretty ropey, just got a flu-like illness, you don't quite know what's going on, and then suddenly the spots start to erupt. And you get this progression from macules to papules to vesicles to pustules, and then they scab over. That's if you recover, of course, you might die. Um, in terms of history, um, Ramses V of Egypt... This guy here, he had lesions on, his, on the mummy which looked like smallpox. Nobody's been able to isolate any smallpox or smallpox DNA, but it looks reasonably plausible that he might have had smallpox. Now, there's this, this uh, idea of this elephant war in Mecca where smallpox is supposed to have decimated the Ethiopian soldiers. And that may be what did it. Uh, smallpox introduced into the New World actually decimated the indigenous populations of the New World, and so this certainly facilitated European conquest of the Americas because the Native Americans just died in such large numbers. Uh, ethnic groups in South Africa, the Khoi Khoi, were decimated by smallpox. 1738, you can see there that half the Cherokee population. Smallpox disrupted the colonial army in, in Quebec as well and may have had an influence, an impact on the American War of Independence and change the course of history that way. Now, the first intervention to try and prevent smallpox came with something called variolation, where basically you take some pipes, some of the material from a lesion of, of smallpox, some flakes, and you uh, inoculate that into uh, someone who hasn't got Smallpox hasn't had smallpox yet. Now, you can see, we'll say, well, that's a mad thing to do, surely, because you're actually deliberately, be, deliberately giving someone smallpox, but you're at least controlling the, the circumstances under which that happens, when they're fit and well, and uh, there is a, a chance of doing it that way, you're actually going to get a, a, a lesser form of the illness, the case fatality rate, though, was still quite appreciable. 2% of people still died from this practice. And, of course, anyone who gets infected deliberately like that can then act as a source of infection for other people. So, although it was, uh, you, you could argue back in, that, in the day, it was a kind of rational approach. It was not by any means ideal. The modern era, uh, in terms of smallpox control, began in, in 1796, when uh, Edward Jenner took pus from the lesions of, a, of the hands of a dairymaid, Sarah Nelms, and inoculated them into a boy called James Phipps. Uh, James Phipps was later challenged with smallpox and had no response. 
This is built on the observation that, that uh, dairy maids tended not to, to get smallpox if they'd had infection with cowpox first. It was also, you could argue from today's perspective, this was child abuse. Sorry? Uh, it's, it's not smallpox, it's air that they use, so that's Yes, they yes. They yeah, so, so that may account for the fact that the mortality rate from getting it through variolation is less than being exposed to it naturally. They are the same, but, they're, but, but you're probably right in that the actual quantity of material numbers of infectious particles you're putting in is probably lower. And, and that may influence the, the outcome of the disease. So if you're exposed to a full-blown case of smallpox where it's just been shed as an aerosol around the patient and a cloud of smallpox virus particles, the infectious dose may well be higher than you get if you just stick a little bit in your skin. The other thing, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know if anyone's actually done any modern studies. It'd be hard to do them to see what happens when you put it into a different route. So instead of it going in through... Uh, the airways, uh, it goes in through the skin. It may be presented <coughs> immunologically differently such that you get a different outcome as well. Okay, so, yeah, you could say this was child abuse, you know, to deliberately infect a child with something. But in, you have to look back at those days. This was a disease that, that killed large numbers of people and it was kind of inevitable everyone was going to get it sometime. And so it kind of does make sense in context. Um... And um, Jenner himself predicted that this might be the beginning of the end for smallpox. Um, and um, in fact, there's a letter from Thomas Jefferson also to Jenner around the same time saying the same thing, that this, if this was rolled out properly across the world, you could see the logical prediction was that it would be the end of smallpox. In fact, if you, if you want a nice day out, um, you can go and see Jenner's house in the, in, in the village of Berkeley, uh, down in, in Gloucestershire, it's just a, about an hour and 20 minutes down the M5 from here it is. It's, 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 it wasn't universally accepted and there's certainly always been this anti-vaccination movement. Here's a cartoon showing cows, you can't quite see it, but, it, you know, it's, but you know, people are being vaccinated and then cows are erupting out of their arms. You know, it, it's a fanciful idea that you'll turn into a cow if you get the, the cowpox vaccine. And, and this is one of my own pictures. This is Jenner actually in, in the cathedral at Gloucester, uh, a, a statue of him commemorating him. Anyway, it did roll out that way kind of thing in that vaccination spread. There were missions to establish mass vaccination in various colonies. Um, in, in the early 19th century, they managed to grow the virus on the flank of a calf. Um, this, that, that's the, the vaccine virus, not the smallpox virus. Um, in fact, I went to a meeting on the eradication of smallpox a few years ago, and they told me that they used to grow the vaccine on the site, still do that, but basically take a calf and then scarify the side and put the, some pus from a previous calf to infect them, and then come back a little while later, scrape out all the pus and lymph nodes to make up the vaccine, and then the people that worked at the vaccine institute were allowed to take home the lamb uh, or the calf and eat it. Uh, it's just kind of... This was back in the 1940s, which is sort of thing. I suppose that was still when food rationing was on, but it just seems amazing that they would... I mean, if you cook it, obviously you sterilise it. But Anyway, I'm getting off again. Uh, smallpox vaccination in Native Americans. We banned variolation, and then compulsory smallpox vaccination came in. And so by the 1900s, we'd largely eliminated smallpox from USA and Northern Europe. And the smallpox that did remain was that attenuated form uh, uh, as the stuff that was transmitting in our own communities. By the end of World War I, we got rid of smallpox from most of Europe, and by the end of World War II, basically, it was no longer endemic within Europe and North America. It wasn't spreading from person to person in the communities there. Obviously, we're still getting smallpox because people were coming from overseas, from countries where it was endemic, and bringing it in. But we weren't seeing it transmitting in our own societies. A guy called Leslie Collier in the 1940s managed to produce a stable freeze-dried vaccine, which meant that you didn't have to have a cold chain anymore. You, could, you wouldn't have to keep making the vaccine. You could actually make it and then store it for long periods of time, take it around the world and into remote parts. 
And then the Pan American Health Organization launched an eradication campaign to take it in the whole hemisphere. And they, they were successful apart from just a handful of countries there. But by the time we got to 1958, you know, we, we'd done a lot, but there were still 2 million people dying every year from smallpox. And in, in the early 20th century, up to that date, more people have died from smallpox than in all the wars. You know, Hitler, and Mao and Stalin, they had nothing else in terms of you know, killing people. And so in 1958, this guy here, Viktor Zdanov, who was the Deputy Minister of Health for the USSR, actually made a, a, a call at um, the World Health Assembly, which was the kind of annual meeting of the World Health Organization. That year, it was, happened to be held in Minneapolis. It was usually held in Geneva, but they held it in America that year. And in fact, the USSR had stayed out of the WHO for, for most of, the, of its time, of, since it was founded, they were sort of moaning about the fact they didn't give enough resources to Eastern Europe. But they came back that year, and they came back with a bang when this guy got up and said, why don't we just eradicate smallpox from the world? Um, he argued that there was this um, continual problem that countries where you'd eradicated it were still at risk because it was continually getting imported. So, you know, we were never going to get rid of it from the, the, uh, these places. And in effect, no one was safe from smallpox until everyone was safe from smallpox. And he argued that, you know, a big effort right there, right now, would actually save a huge amount in the long run. Um, and in fact, the resolution was accepted uh, the following year, and the world eradication, uh, global eradication campaign started. And it rolled on ahead, and it did a great job. Uh, between 1945 and 1967, you can see that we go from large parts of the world in which smallpox was endemic to just a, uh, a few dozen countries um, still seeing importations, but, but basically most of the world starting to get free. Now, why, why on earth would anyone think that we could have got rid of smallpox? Why was it ripe for eradication? Well, one thing is that it's only humans uh, that get smallpox. There's no animal reservoir. There is, in fact, one instance of a virus very much like smallpox, isolated from a gerbil uh, in uh, Dahomey, but that's about it. There's, there's something called camelpox as well, but they are not quite the same as smallpox. There's no animal reservoir of what we normally call smallpox. It's easy to diagnose. You can look at someone and say, you've got smallpox. Uh, and there's no latent infection or carrier state. Uh, electron microscopes uh, came in in the middle of the 20th century, and they gave an extra layer where... Okay, it looks like smallpox and whatever, but if you want absolute certainty, look down the electron microscope and you can see the smallpox virus and it's got a characteristic appearance on the electron microscope. And there were cheap, effective ways of interrupting transmission. You've got a vaccine that works, that's cheap and it's stable. And it's also a, a sitting duck. It, it's not a moving target like, say, flu. It doesn't vary. It doesn't have lots of different serotypes and whatever. It's just the same boring old virus from year to year. So what happened was well, this max vaccination campaign came in and um, initially the USSR and USA produced most of it but then uh, they handed on the production to developing countries. Surveillance systems were built to, to detect and contain cases. Basically the two kind of pillars of the eradication campaign freeze-dried smallpox vaccine. So Leslie Collier's breakthrough where he actually added something called peptone, kind of broken up protein uh, to, the, to the vaccine when it was freeze-dried, and that allowed it to remain stable to freeze-dry it, and you could you know, take it on a boat somewhere, uh, take it on the back of a camel or whatever, and it would still retain its potency. And then this thing, the bifurcated needle, which, uh, when stabbed in with the smallpox vaccine, created 98% uh, plus take. So it was a very easy way of delivering the vaccine into someone to get them vaccinated. In 1966, a smallpox eradication unit was formed, and under the leadership of this guy here, D.A. Henderson, who is generally considered as the hero of the eradication campaign, um, it was eradicated in 18 West African countries. Uh, they, you know, they, they just had no fear. Let's just get on with it. So Sierra Leone, that had the highest infection rate in the world, they went in there and they 
uh, vaccinated and they eradicated smallpox. And, and there, it wasn't obviously just D.A. Henderson. There was this whole, whole army of field workers, vaccination guns, government resources, traditional health authorities, everyone working together. 100 million vaccinations over five years. 90% of the population vaccinated. In addition to that kind of mass vaccination, towards the end they started using uh, this so-called ring vaccination approach. So they would take, find, you find a case and then you go and find the contacts of that case and you'd vaccinate all those and then you go and find their contacts and just to be safe you'd vaccinate those as well. So you, you wouldn't have to go in and vaccinate everyone in the whole country, you would just go in uh, in, in the final stages and do this ring vaccination. Things were going well, uh, but in 1972 there was a particular nasty outbreak in Europe, right in the heart of Europe, in, in, in Yugoslavia. There was a Kosovan uh, Muslim guy who returned from the Hajj, and he didn't feel too well the uh, day after he returned. Um, and then he started to feel, he fell ill with uh, the highly contagious form of smallpox, and he was misdiagnosed, and he managed to infect um, lots of different people. Uh, sorry, I'm getting confused there. There's, there's two guys, actually, Latif Musa as well. So Musa actually infected 38 people in hospitals uh, in Yugoslavia. Um, he was actually shown to medical students as an example of a reaction to penicillin. It's thought to be a penicillin allergy rash. And so all these students at the end of his bed looking at this guy with florid smallpox. He died from internal bleeding uh, the next day. And then um, this, uh, um, the diagnosis was only made uh, nearly a fortnight later and suddenly they managed to then start to recognize what's going on and began uh, revaccination. Donald Henderson was brought in as the kind of as head of the hit squad. Um, and within that outbreak, uh, there were 175 people infected and 35 died. There were also um, serious kind of civil liberties issues. People were actually imprisoned during quarantine to stop them from going out and infecting anyone else. But the, the, you know, the gallop of uh, progress was, was reaching quite a pace at that time. The, the, this eradication campaign intensified. There were numerous problems, and, and really we have to stress the heroic efforts here. There was a lack of organization in the National Health Service. Smallpox among refugees, fleeing areas stricken by civil war and famine. There was always a shortage of funds and vaccine. And actually going out to the most remote parts of the world you know, was an heroic un undertaking. Difficult terrain, climate, the cultural beliefs, these people coming in from outside, from, from Europe or Asia or whatever, going into remote parts of Africa or Asia. Um, in the Indian subcontinent, Smallpox was, they had an epidemic in India with 15,000 deaths. Uh, Henderson arrived in New Delhi and actually managed to eradicate smallpox by uh, 1975 from the whole of the Indian subcontinent. And the last case of the naturally occurring severe form of smallpox, variola major, occurred in Bangladesh, in this child here, Rahima Banu. In, on the 16th of October 1975. We have a local hero. I don't know if any of you know this guy, Alistair Geddes. He retired, uh, I think, about eight, nine, ten years ago. Uh, he was a professor of infectious diseases here. Um, and he still lives in Solihull. He's still an emeritus professor here. And he was involved in the eradication campaign. He went to Bangladesh in 1973. And here are some of the pictures from his, uh, from his scrapbook. Um, and it gives you an idea of the kind of conditions that people were working on, you know, carrying bicycles across makeshift wooden bridges, going into boats uh, across the rivers, uh, and going into these uh, remote villages and vaccinating people there. By the end of 1975, smallpox persisted only in the Horn of Africa, uh, then as now, this was one of the most difficult areas of the world, both in terms of geography and the politics of, of getting stuff in there. In fact, the politics was probably easier back then than it is now, uh, because Somalia was still 
more or less a country then, whereas now it's a kind of failed state. But anyhow, more and more resources were made available in Africa um, and it intensified. Very difficult conditions though, the roads were poor, there was war still going on, Ethiopia and Somalia, Eritrea, Tigray, all those kind of conflicts, famine for refugees. But they managed to wrestle it down. And the last case of smallpox, naturally occurring smallpox, seen anywhere in the world was this guy, Ali Miao Marlin, who was a cook <coughs> who lived in Somalia. And that was the last case. Unfortunately, it wasn't the last case, it was the last natural case, because uh, just a year or so later, um, we actually saw a case here in Birmingham, just a few hundred yards from where we're now sitting or standing. So Janet Parker was a photographer who worked here in the medical school in the dark room in the east wing of the medical school above a lab that was doing research on live smallpox viruses. She actually had been vaccinated against smallpox in 1966, but obviously that wasn't good enough. On August the 11th in 1978, she actually fell ill. It was actually on a Friday she started to feel ill and she soldiered on at work and then she took the rest of the weekend to, to convalesce. She got headache, myalgia, rash. Three general practitioners, all of them uh, alumni of the University of Birmingham Medical School, managed to make a mess of the diagnosis. One said she might have influenza, the next one said, oh, it's a viral infection and gave ampicillin, which you shouldn't do for a viral infection. So the third one said, oh, she's got a drug rash, a bit like in the Yugoslav outbreak. Of course, to cut them some slack, nobody in the middle of the heart of England would have suspected smallpox at that stage because it had been eradicated from the whole world. And so it's perhaps unfair to, to uh, poke fun at them for getting it wrong. She was admitted to the East Birmingham Hospital and, in fact, this slide's a little bit out of date. I don't think Thomas Henry Fluitt had much in the way of uh, role of diagnosis. Uh, it was a guy, Henry Morgan, actually first saw her, and he called Alistair Geddes, who had seen smallpox, and Henry had a vague idea that this might be something a bit odd and called Alistair in. Alistair came in and saw her and said, yep, this looks like smallpox, and they... Alistair knew that they were working on smallpox in the medical school and actually made the connection in his mind between the fact that she was working in the east wing not far from where they were working on it. Uh, and in fact, it was confirmed that night by electron microscopy. Here are some pictures that uh, Alistair gave me. Um, so she was admitted to... Uh, so this is the smallpox laboratory that was in the east wing of the medical school. This is the East Birmingham Hospital which is now on the same site, well, is that, that's Heartland's hospital site. And there was an isolation ward there, and she went in there. These are her legs. I do have a picture of her face as well, but it's so unpleasant, I don't really feel I could share it with you. And I, I'm not sure whether Alistair had consent to take it. Um, she ended up in this place here, this uh, smallpox hospital. In Warwickshire, actually, it's not in Birmingham. When people say, oh, the last case was in Birmingham, well, it was acquired in Birmingham, but she spent her last hours here in Solihull, in the borough of Solihull, in a place called Catherine de Barnes. Um, she was transferred there as soon as the diagnosis was made, and she died on September 11th. That's kind of a, a resonant sort of date. Um, her mother actually caught it from her, and... She survived. So when people say Janet was the last case of smallpox, it's not quite right, because her mother, Hilda Whitcomb, was in fact the last ever case. Her father actually died while visiting her in hospital. Um, now, whether he just was so horrified at what he saw and had a heart attack, whether he was actually incubating smallpox is not clear. It was decided that there should be no autopsy on her, him because the risks of actually opening him up and uh, laying open the risk to the... Uh, person doing the autopsy was considered too high, so he, his body was just uh, cremated. So we don't know if he actually caught it as well. 20,000 people were vaccinated as a result of this. There were no major reactions. There were no deaths from vaccination. But it made quite a stir in the region. And if, if you know anyone who lived here at that time, go and ask them what they remember about it. There were more tragedies to come. This guy, Henry Bedson, was the head of the medical microbiology unit, and he was the one that was actually looking after that smallpox lab. And um, 
he, the, you know, people had said, oh, we should stop working on smallpox now, it was eradicated, but he was concerned to continue working on it. He had reasons. He was actually looking at various viruses that um, might have been uh, propagated in animals and was concerned about the fact that you, if you eradicate it from humans, maybe it could persist in, in animals. But he was so distraught at the, 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 the turn of events, and particularly when he was put into quarantine himself, so although he was initially at the first meeting to try and deal with this outbreak, he was then put into quarantine, and, and he knew most about the, the disease, and he wanted to get involved, and instead he was stuck at home, and he just get pestered repeatedly dozens of times during the day by journalists trying to get an angle on this. So he went one even, that evening into his garden shed and cut his throat. Um, he was taken, to, it wasn't the QE hospital actually, he was taken to the, what used to be called the Birmingham Accident Hospital, and they did some heroic surgery, but he didn't survive. And he said in his suicide note, sorry to have misplaced the trust of so many colleagues and friends. So a very tragic series of events. There was a guy, uh, Shooter, Professor Shooter, Richard Shooter, who came and did a report on this very shortly afterwards and highlighted what he saw as failings in health and safety. Um, in fact, uh, on further investigation, his, flaw was, his report was pretty flawed and the university was taken to court and won in court to show that the university hadn't been at fault here. Here's the, the part of the medical school where it all took place. And it still looks pretty much like that today. If you go and have a look, you'll see it looks pretty much like that. But it's, it's been found its way into uh, fiction. There's a Patricia Cornwell novel based on this outbreak. Anyway, that's a bit miserable. The good thing is that that was it. Then global eradication was certified. In 1980, the WHO declared solemnly the world and its people as one freedom from smallpox. Um, and this was a really remarkable achievement. Uh, a triumph of the human spirit and of international endeavour. Now, you might argue, sadly, it's not extinct because there are virus stocks kept in two high containment laboratories, one in the Soviet, well, one in Russia now, former Soviet Union, and one in the USA. The genome has been sequenced and is available. And so if you wanted to build the genome from scratch, well, Craig Vent has shown us we can do this with bacterial genomes, so maybe you could do that. There are bioterrorism concerns that maybe someone somewhere has got a few scabs in, uh, in their freezer that they've kept from, because it was only a few decades ago. Um, we don't know. In fact, uh, we're having an, a, a symposium in December um, and we've got a guy called David Relman coming from Stanford University. And David Relman, uh, you might argue, is reckless or brave, has actually been doing work on live smallpox uh, virus and shown that he can get an, a, a monkey model of smallpox infection uh, just in the last few years. People, so I'm writing a book on this, actually, due in 2012. Well, that's a bit optimistic. It'll be 2013 at least before it's finished. Anyway... I need to move on because I'm going too slowly. I want to share one other story with you about eradication, and that's this nasty disease here, trachunculiasis or guinea worm. So this is a, nothing, it's not quite the opposite end of the spectrum from viruses. This is a, a macroscopic parasite. You can see there it comes out of the hand or the, or the foot, sometimes can come out of other places, out of a breast or whatever. Uh, the, the adult worms live in the subcutaneous tissues. There's one year after infection between inf infection and the formation of a blister which is, itches and hurts and then bursts and out come these female worms. They can be up to 80 centimetres long. Usually a person just has one or two or most three of these per season, but there are exceptional cases where a person just erupts with 40 of them coming out of their body. They're extremely painful when they come out. Um, and that's why the term little drag, dragon trachunculus is sometimes applied, because it's you know, the, the fiery breath. What happens is that people immerse their legs in water, because the pain, and that releases thousands of larvae into the water, and these get eaten by these water fleas, and within the water fleas they mature into an infective stage, and then people go on and drink the, the water uh, that's got those water fleas in. And then the worms hatch out a new mate and then they migrate through 
And remarkably, they come out of your stomach, they migrate through your tissues, and they find their way out to the subcutaneous tissues. It's kind of like an incredible journey through your, your body. And, and uh, we still don't think we know exactly how they're doing that and how they're avoiding the immune system and all that kind of stuff. So this just shows diagrammatically the life cycle. So the cycle starts with someone putting their leg in the water, and out come the worm and, and the larvae, and then they go into the water, please, and someone drinks it, and then it travels through the body. In history, well, we've, it, as long as it goes three and a half thousand years, we have a record of something that may well be uh, trachonculiasis, and the treatment then, as now, was that you just wrap the emerging end of the worm around, worm around a stick and then slowly pull it out. There's no magic approach to get the thing out. You just slowly, people often use a matchstick to slowly wind it down. There's arguments to be made that the serpents that are described in the Bible and other ancient texts and maybe even the staff of Asclepius are actually based on this worm coming out of people. This is a horrible disease uh, in terms of its effect on individuals, but in terms of socioeconomic impact, it also has a, an appreciable uh, burden. Patients are bed-bound, can't work when the worm's coming out of you, you can't work on the harvest, Some, sometimes called the, the, the disease of the empty granary. There is long-term pain and loss of mobility, malnutrition, loss of income, disruption to education for children, so it kind of cascades through a society. Now, you might say, what a gloomy picture. And it gets even gloomier when I say there is no vaccine against this organism and there are no drugs to treat. The only thing we can do in terms of treatment is where we can look after the wound and make sure, you know, if there's a super infection, they get a staph aureus in that wound as well, then we can treat that. And we just take the worm out slowly over a period of several days, mechanically uh, extracting the worm. But this is ideal for eradication, a bit like smallpox. There is no animal or long-lived environmental reservoir, so it continually needs to pass through humans every year. Uh, the carrier state in those water fleas and in humans is of limited duration, and it, you only need to, to break the transmission for one year, particularly where there's a seasonal seasonality to this. And... There, it's fairly easy to prevent transmission because it's a fairly direct thing. There's no like mosquitoes in malaria that's going to fly five miles, ten miles, hundred miles down the road. The cyclops, the water flea, is not a mobile vector. It's fairly obvious when you've got it. You can't, you know, if someone's got this, you, you, could, you, you don't need sophisticated electron microscopy. You can see the worm, and that's it. And it has a limited geographical distribution, with, particularly with localised endemic foci. So you can concentrate your efforts on where it happens. Um, and there's this idea of villages of endemicity, so where the, the local pond and water source or well has actually been contaminated, that's where you get infections. And then the next village down the road may not have the problem at all. So you, you can actually focus. Now, in 1980, an advocacy campaign was... Uh, put forward to say, maybe we could get rid of this. And by 1986, uh, there were still 3.5 million cases of guinea worm, 20 endemic nations that spanned Africa and Asia. And then this guy, Jimmy Carter, who, I mean, he gets a lot of bad press for his presidency. He had a single-term presidency in the 1970s. People are saying that, you know, if Obama doesn't win... Tomorrow, you know, he'll be like Jimmy Carter, be one of these people that step in. But Jimmy Carter is probably the greatest ex-president of the United States that we've seen in many years because he's devoted his efforts to world health and particularly to eradicating some of these diseases that really have no interest to people in Wall Street and in the Western world but uh, have a huge burden uh, in the developing world. In 1991, the World Health Assembly said eradicate trachonculiasis by 1995. We didn't quite make it. By 2004, they said let's try and get rid of it by 2009. They didn't quite make it. But the good news is that you know, we have come a huge way forward. So 
just after the turn of the millennium, India announced that it has eradicated Guinea worm disease completely. Um, so in the early 80s, there were 40,000 people a year in India, and then there were none. And if you look uh, at progress across the world, you can see this absolutely plummeting incident uh, over 89 through to 97. And it's worth noting that that is a logarithmic graph. So this really is a dramatic control of infection across the globe. How did they manage it? Well, they had a number of interventions. Education, telling people about the life cycle and about what the worm is and all that kind of stuff. Provide safe water via boreholes and pipes. Filter drinking water. So what they actually... One of the things that Jimmy Carter did was he, he contacted one of his uh, uh, contacts in, in the, I think, the plastic companies, BASF. I think they, make, they used to make cassettes. Uh, I know the name, but, but they, were, they made these plastic. He said, can you make a plastic sieve material, a gauze, that could be used for this purpose? Can you make it quickly and easily? And so they did. So you can sieve your water, or more specifically, you can actually produce a straw that actually has a sieve in that just sieves out the water fleas. So people can drink directly from the source, but through that it gets sieved and they don't have the water fleas. Uh, don't uh, ingest the water fleas. Um, they also search for and manage active cases. Uh, so you try and stop the patient from actually jumping into the pond or into, into a, a, a local water supply. You just say, put your foot in a bucket. Uh, and, and, and that will have the same effect of cooling it down and make you feel better, but it won't infect anyone else. And in fact, they were very um, ingenious in paying elderly people just to sit and watch the ponds and actually stop people from jumping in them. Um, and that uh, also um, helped the local economy. And cash was paid for finding cases or for compliance as well. And uh, where it was clear that a particular pond was infected with the, with the larvae, you could then apply actually larvicides as well. What a remarkable instance in this campaign was the so-called guinea worm ceasefire, where there was uh, a particular uh, period of ceasefire in, in the Sudanese civil war. Uh, here's Jimmy Carter uh, shaking hands here um, with um, Hassan al-Bashir, the um, uh, Sudanese leader, a very unsavoury man, and you could argue that you know one he should wash his hand afterwards for dealing with such a horrible man. But this is politics, and they actually did manage to get this um, uh, agreement. And and now that so, so, so the uh, South Sudan has actually broken away from Sudan, and perhaps things are calming down. This may actually be a good sign that they can actually get in there. So, the WHO has now certified 180 countries free of guinea worm. There were four countries with domestic transmission in 2009. 86% um, of the world's cases are still in southern Sudan, and that is an area that's been long affected by civil strife, but hopefully things are calming down, but maybe not. Um, the WHO are predicting at the moment it will be a few years yet. They're not saying... It's going to be 2014 or 2015. They've kind of got a bit wise to being quite that uh, pres prescriptive about it. Um, if you look back at where the countries that are left, where other countries that got rid of it were, how long it was between that stage and when they got rid of it, six to 12 years is what people are saying. There's actually a countdown uh, on, the, on the Carter Foundation site. This is an old screen grab. The latest figures I got was there was just over a thousand cases last year uh, across the whole world, and the majority of those in South Sudan. That's a thousand cases down from 3.5 million before the eradication campaign began. So you, we are going to get there, um, but it might just take us a couple more years. And of course, the, the key thing we need is uh, is world peace for all of these things in you know, areas where there is military disruption. These are the areas where it's hard to get this stuff done. In fact, there are lots of good things happen with this eradication campaign as side effects, if you like, uh, listed here that improved water quality, created jobs, empowered volunteers, improved women's uh, uh, power through networks and so forth. 
So I'm almost finished now. Um, in terms of eradication, in, in previous years I tried to give, uh, include many other organisms and many other infections in this talk and realised that I would always run out of time if I did that. But here's tabulated some of the candidates that we might want to get rid of. Um, and you can see there isn't one size that fits all. There, in each case there are subtle differences from, in, in terms of whether there are reservoirs, whether there's mobile vectors, whether it's easy, whether it's to prevent transmission, whether there are the vaccines and so on. One subject that I would have liked to have spoken about, but we, we only have a fine amount of time, is polio. And so polio is another interesting case where we're very, very close to eradication. We're inching forward, but it's often two steps forward, one step back um, with this. And it would be nice to say that probably in, in your lifetimes, in my lifetime, probably we will get rid of polio, but we can't be certain. India is at the moment very close to being able to declare itself polio free, but then Pakistan has lots of polio, so we don't know how long that will go on. So, I used an old phrase from, phrase from Obama, which seems perhaps a little bit uh, careworn these days with the amount of trouble that Obama's having and getting re elected. But the conclusion is yes, we can eradicate diseases, and I think. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we have these heroes, Jimmy Carter, uh, and the work that he's done, um, not just on guinea worm, but on things like river blindness as well. And in fact, Bill and Melinda Gates have actually done a great deal of work here. And, and I think, you know, within my life, so I'm confident we will have eradicated smallpox, polio, guinea worm, river blindness, leprosy. And it's possible within your lifetimes we may well have eradicated TB and malaria as well. Um, how are we doing for time? I've got a video that lasts for about four minutes on guinea worm if you really want any more of this.